let's look at chapter 13, distribution and the fusion of arterial solution. Well, we can also call um, our regular arterial embalming capillary embalming. Capillaries are the smallest blood vessels in the human body. Um, solution that gets into the capillaries will then pass onto the tissue. So since the preservation actually um, uses the capillaries, that's why we call it capillary embalming. We have intravascular movement, which is the movement of blood through the blood vascular system, and interstitial movement, which is the movement of solution outside the vasculature into the tissue spaces where it reacts with the cells. It does this by something called passive, passive transport systems. Passive transports require no cellular activity, no energy from the body to actually do it. And this is important because the body's dead. And obviously, we want to retain as much preservative in the body as possible without visibly swelling or distending the body so that uh, we get what we're looking for in regards to preservation and also the body is sanitized as much as possible. Vascular embalming is thought of as one process. We inject it, it gets done. But realistically, um, and this is a, more of a theoretical than it is anything else, because it does happen all at once very quickly. Uh, there's four divisions. We have delivery from the solution through the tubing and arterial tube. Solution moving through the arterial system to the capillaries called perfusion. Movement from the vascular system to the walls of the capillaries to the tissue spaces, so from the capillaries outside, and then the draining of the fluids from any one of the many avenues, either direct drainage by circuiting through the vasculature and out via the veins, or being pushed into the tissue spaces and removed via the lymph. Drainage is taken from a vein. Any vein will do, okay? Any vein will do. However, we typically go for the largest one we can and in certain areas. As much as 50% of drainage by the time you're done can be arterial solution. So if you have a three-gallon tank, plan on about a gallon and a half of that actually going down the drain. It does say that blood is interstitial fluid, arterial solution, and blood. Obviously, we cannot separate those components quickly and easily at the uh, prep room level, um, but be aware that Initial drainage will be blood, and then as we start pushing through things, it'll be more arterial solution and interstitial fluid. The vascular system is not closed, so the fluid can diffuse or pass through capillary walls and pores into the interstitial spaces. In the tissue spaces, a fluid surrounds and bathes the cells of the body. In life, the tissue fluid serves to transport nutrients and oxygen to keep the cells healthy. Blood itself never leaves the vascular system. Your blood cells are basically public transportation. They're buses. They drive up and down the streets in major, in major arteries, major routes to major places, but they're not going to drop you off for the most part on the doorstep of your home. Blood acts the same exact way. Blood goes through the capillaries. Anything that needs to be transported will be dropped off. Things that need to be transported to waste centers get put on, and away they go. The tissue fluid also carries waste of cells, um, cell metabolism to the blood vascular system where they're carried to the organs of the body that dispose of the waste. And that's that final part. Similar process occurs in arterial embalming. We have the solution flows through the arteries throughout the body. It gets to the capillaries. A portion of the fluid leaves the capillaries and passes into the fluid uh, to the tissue spaces, enters the cells, and reacts with the cell protein centers. The embalming solution that passes through the pores and walls of the capillaries and eventually embalms the cell is retained. This is what stabilizes the body. This is what preserves the body. Anything else gets pushed ahead. So if it does push through the capillary pores into the spaces, it enters into the veins, and once it's in, into the veins, it's on the highway out. That's all there is to it. The only thing that solution does is help preserve the walls of the veins and anything else it might come in contact with on the way out. Muscle cells and connective tissue cells account for the majority of the body, and their preservation is essential if the composition is to be halted, thorough and extended preservation of the body is to be achieved. So drainage is a combination we've seen of blood, arterial solution, and interstitial fluid. And now he adds lymphatic fluid, and there's a reason for that. IF, interstitial fluid, becomes part of drainage through two routes. 
In living bodies, interstitial fluid will exit via the lymph system, okay? The lymph system, where it becomes lymphatic fluid. The lymph system empties into your large veins in your upper thorax. So by the time it dumps back in, everything is going to be in the same area. Arterial solution is going to flow in. When it does that, it's actually going to pull some of that interstitial fluid into the capillary as well. So something comes in, something comes out. The interstitial fluid that get pulls into the capillary will exit via normal routes and drainage. On the other end, as the fluid is pushing in, the stuff that doesn't get pushed into the capillaries will be pushed into the lymph system, and then the lymph system will push it into the veins in a higher area. Arterial embalming involves both physical and chemical applications. So physical, filling the arterial system with forced injection under pressure, uh, control of drainage is a physical process. Uh, some of the injected solution is forced through the walls of the capillary simply by the physical process of filtration. In chemical, obviously, a fluid is properly diluted. It's a homogeneous solution that is hypotonic. Through physical process of osmosis and dialysis, this hypotonic solution passes from the capillaries into the interstitial spaces. The preservatives in the solution chemically combine with protein in the cells, protein in the microorganisms, and it's pretty much business as normal. Preservation happens. It's done. Arterial embalming begins with the injection of the preservative solution under pressure into any artery that we can possibly use. That's important because we can pretty much use any artery to embalm the body. We just want the biggest one we can access for the best job. And it gives you a definition of arterial embalming there. You can, look, you can add that to the list of definitions. It is necessary to inject embalming solution under pressure. Think about it. If we don't push this in, it's going to hit fluid in the body and just stop. So we actually have to push at a higher rate than the body inside is pushing back. In the early apparatus people were using for injecting were gravity injectors. The higher you raise the bucket or the bottle, the more pressure it's going to push. The body offers resistance to injection by intravascular resistance, which is something inside the vasculature, fluid, blood, whatever it is, that pushes back against what you're doing, and extravascular, which is anything outside the vasculature system. Could be body weight, could be the tumor, could be anything. Resistances affect arterial solution distribution. Poor or good distribution requires poor or good diffusion. If you have good distribution, you will generally probably have diffusion. If you have poor distribution, you will most certainly have poor diffusion in the areas where it's just not getting to. And pressure is needed to overcome those resistances to make things happen. As the embalming solution travels from the aorta into the arterioles and capillaries, the diameter of the arterial system actually expands because of the innumerable, bran innumerable branches of the vessels. So there are a lot of things that have collapsed or simply don't have blood in it at any one given time um, in the respect that your body is constantly monitoring moisture levels, hydration, and everything, uh, temperature even. And it will close vasculature in your body to safeguard a lot of things. The colder it is outside, it will start to close off vessels to retain core heat, which is why we get frostbite in our fingers. So those areas that are closed, now that we're pushing fluid in there, will actually expand and will start filling things out. Pressure is needed to force this solution through these arteries because by the time the solution reaches the capillaries, it is losing a lot and then has to circle around and come back. Pressurized injection is also responsible for some of the diffusion. Simply the pressure of pushing it will force the liquid through the pores in the capillaries. Arterial solution at the microcirculatory level can take three routes. This is, now we're focused on the capillary. A portion flows through the capillaries where some of the embalming solution passes through the walls, the pores of the capillaries, to embalm tissues, the cells and the tissue spaces. The portion that remains in the capillaries flows onto the veins and helps to remove the blood from the capillaries and the veins and exits as drainage. The remaining embalming solution flows direct through the um, direct connections of arterial to venule and eventually exits as drainage. So keep in mind that in your body, 
you have direct connections where an artery forms right into a vein and comes back around, never actually gets into a um, capillary, which means it never, whatever is in that arterial never has an opportunity to drop off nutrients or pick up waste. It just comes right back around and away it goes. It's a U-turn. Other parts have capillaries. Once they get to the capillaries, they can do some good, and then they turn around and come back. Intravascular pressure brings about pressure filtration that moves embalming solution from the capillaries into the interstitial spaces. It's created by the pressure from the machine and the expansion of the arteries. This pressure affects embalming solution filtration through the walls of the capillaries. Pressure filtration is one of the major processes by which embalming solution enters the tissue spaces. Intravascular pressure also remains with the embalming solution that flows into the venous system. So there is some pressure that once you push this stuff in and it's creeping down into smaller and smaller and smaller pipes into the arterioles of the capillaries and then comes around into a venule and starts pushing back out, there is pressure in that venous side. Drainage exhibits half a pound per square inch pressure, most of which comes from the arterial solution following directly through connecting routes, the arterial to venule. It's the larger pipe. More of the pressure is going to be retained as it makes the U-turn. It makes sense. So that would be important. Drainage exhibits half a pound per square inch. During life, some capillaries remain devoid of blood. I explained that a couple slides ago. Um, as a result of vasoconstriction. Some areas have more blood as a result of vasodilation. At death, the vascular system relaxes and this increases its capacity, which is why we can put in a large volume of solution without causing immediate distension or swelling of the tissues. It's also why we don't get immediate drainage. If you are getting immediate drainage, that's your clue that something is short-circuiting and you need to fix it. Drainage from the average body is about half or less the total volume of arterial solution selected. Now we start jumping into the usual embalming book mayhem where numbers start getting jumbled. 50% of drainage is arterial solution. It says here 50% or less, but 50%, 50% or less, 50% is still the magic number. Either way, you want to keep at least half of what you put in to do its job. And you have to do everything you can to promote that distribution to retain as much as possible. And the old rule of thumb was for every gallon, it should cover 50 pounds. Or for every 50 pounds, you inject one gallon. Now, if you do the embalming math, if you do the uh, formaldehyde demand uh, computation, you will see that that is a fairly accurate rule of thumb. But if you simply go by the rule of thumb, you are not using your embalming analysis. You're not actually paying attention to what the body um, is demanding of you. So use that as a guide. That's a good idea. But do not just immediately jump and go, oh, it's 150 pounds, uh, three gallons is good. Or, oh, look, there's, uh, you know, there are 500 pounds. Let's do this one. I mean, seriously, 10 gallons, you're probably going to inflate the body, you know, ridiculously. So pay attention to what you're doing. Today, rely on that embalming analysis. Observation and is necessary to determine if you need to go from a one point to a multi point or split point or whatever you need to do so that the body is preserved. Extravascular and intravascular resistances are responsible for non uniformity in distribution. Also, diameters of artery, the arterial tube, and the delivery hose all produce resistance as a thumb. The largest artery, carotid or femoral, should be selected in an arterial tube of appropriate size inserted. The tube should not damage the inner wall, the tunica intima or the intima of the artery. Intravascular resistance can be caused by obstructions or narrowing of the lumen of a vessel. The lumen, if you recall, is the hole of the artery or the vein. The narrowing or obstruction is brought about by conditions, typically uh, emboli, antemortem thrombi, coagula, sclerosis, etc. A coagulum that is loosened will eventually clog a small artery ahead of it. Remember, your arterial system, as it flows down the pipes, gets smaller. So if you look, break something off, when it finally gets to a point that is too small, it's going to block that artery into the ability to inject through it. So now you have to inject past it. 
which is why we run into issues. It's why your book says in so many chapters, and will continue to say in more chapters, start your injection slow and build up speed after you've established good distribution. The only way to get fluid around an obstruction is through collateral circulation. So if you are driving down the highway, and the quickest way to get to the shopping mall is to get off at exit 5, and exit 5 is blocked, you are forced to find and detour somewhere else to get there. That's exactly what happens in your arterial system when you get a clot that blocks an artery. The unfortunate part is it might take around the mountain to get to the point that is now blocked. It talks about why the lumen can be um, narrowed. Uh, arterial sclerosis is the most common that we see in the lower extremities, femorals on south. Uh, basal constriction, arteritis, which is an inflammation of the artery. And those of you that have taken pathology or anatomy might know that term. Uh, intravascular rigor mortis and external rigor mortis. Remember, you have these little itty bitty muscles and things that um, surround your arteries. So that intravascular rigor mortis, those muscles that control the arteries and whatnot, those are going to go into rigor under Nystin's law, just like any of the big muscles of your body. And if it is intravascular, uh, you basically fall in the category of screwed. There's little you can do. You go around it. That's really the best you can do. Use sufficient pressure and rate of flow to uniformly distribute the arterial solution. Uh, slow rate of flow helps to prevent coagulant the arteries from floating free and clogging the smaller branches. Once circulation is established, then you can push the rate of flow higher. If you do anticipate clots, restricted cervical injection. Inject from the right common carotid. Isolate the head. That way you don't push anything in the head to make your life miserable. It says here this pushes coagula away from the arteries that supply the head. Lakes can be injected separately and treated by hypodermic or surface embalming because they're usually non-visible areas. So we can have a bit more luxury with it. But the face, we are stuck trying to view the face no matter what. And we really don't want to try to raise facials or anything if we don't have to because that starts putting cuts and things in visible areas of the face. Avoid using sclerotic arteries if at all possible for embalming. And generally, the femoral and external iliac are the sclerotic ones. Use the largest artery possible for injection and the arterial tube of the largest side. He's going to say this like a dozen times in this chapter. Extravascular resistance is pressure placed on the outside of a blood vessel that may collapse a lumen. You are better able to remove extravascular resistances. If you have a lot of um, gas distension in an abdomen pushing down on an abdominal aorta, you can make a cut with a scalpel and insert a trocar. You're going to see that in one of the other chapters. There's a lot of things you can do. Rigor. Rigor can be present in some areas, not present in others. It can cause uneven distribution of arterial fluid. Embalming prior to or during onset of rigor is generally recommended for multiple reasons. Um, use gentle firm massage to reduce rigor prior to and during injection. And during the first gallon injection, ensure massage of the extremities along vascular routes. So if you are massaging, just don't grab an arm and do some deep tip. Massage where the arteries are in the direction things are flowing. That's the point of doing it if you're going to do it at all. Gas and cavities. Well, punk a hole in it. Boom. Done. Could get her done. I mean, it's gas. If you punch a hole in something and gas is there, the gas will leak out. Be careful, though. If the gas has a microbial agent or just good old-fashioned foul smelling, um, you don't want to be there. So generally, if you're going to do it, use a trocar. Or if you're not comfortable putting in a trocar, if the skin is too hard to do that, make a small incision with the scalpel and then put the trocar in. Uh, and you might want to have a tube attached to the trocar. That way you don't have to be sniffing what's coming out. Uh, may need to puncture some of the large and small intestines. That's always fun. Um, the newbies have some trouble with that when you have to sit there and maybe, you know, take some scissors and snip the large intestine to let the gas out, which smells just absolutely amazing, as you can imagine. If you are injecting, um, sometimes you might have expansion of the intestines during the uh, injection process. And generally that is caused because you are pushing too fast. Your rate of flow is a little high. Usually it's accompanied by stomach purge. Well, think about it. If your intestines are swelling, they're going to push against your tummy, and your tummy is going to come out the only holes that are available. And the quickest one is the mouth and nose. Uh, puncture some of the intestines to relieve pressure. At that point, you're probably going to have to do some of that. Tumors and swollen lymph nodes, well, sectional injection is the best way. Go around it. 
Uh, high injection pressure pulsation can help. That is, massage and manipulation can also be successful. And one thing I will just pre again to people is you can wait it out. It's okay to wait it out. I know in modern society, in the modern prep room, it's get it done, get it done, get it done, moving on to the next one, quick, quick, quick. Oh my God, why is that taking you two hours? The fact of the matter is, um, in my experience here in the prep center at Miami Dade College, we get some of the most horrible cases you can imagine. And it is a very, very, very rare circumstance. And we do about maybe 30 bodies in a semester. And if I'm embalming and I'm doing maybe 15 to 20 of those, it is highly uncommon for me to have to do a non-one-point injection. Very uncommon. Maybe out of the 15 I do, one of them might have to be a uh, split injection or a multi-point where I have to inject something separately. But I will tell you from experience that doing this job with starting slow and just letting the body accept it as it goes has always worked out for me. Ascites and hydrothorax, drainage from several sites may be required. While well, you're looking at uh, water collection throughout the body and especially the chest. So all that pressure is going to push down. And you're going to want to try to get rid of as much of that as possible. Uh, use a trocar, a drain tube placed through a puncture in the abdominal wall. We'll talk more about that in another chapter, the proper places to put that. Contact pressure, just having the table, um, the body on the table, is enough to cause pressure. So what can you do? Body bridges. Get the body above something to relieve some of that pressure. And if it's visceral weight, there's really not much you can do about visceral weight because that's the weight of the body itself. So you're just going to have to try to overcome it with higher pressure, pulsation, more rapid rate of flow. Uh, and I would probably say, just for the sake of argument, that is in the order of preference, that use higher pressure. I might actually put pulsation in front of higher pressure. But pulsation first, then try to add pressure, and then last resort, add rate of flow. Uh, just because of the fact that rate of flow, as we've seen, will generally increase abdominal swelling, pressure by itself will not. So you might be able to get by with that. And manipulation and massage will also assist you. If that fails, sectional embalming. It is what it is. Bandages, get rid of, of the bandages if you can. Uh, if they're holding on something like an IV tube, which you're not supposed to uh, remove until after injection is over, take that into consideration. If it's wrapping all the way around and it's really, really tight, use some common sense. Take that tape off, put another piece of tape on just to hold the IV in place. And obviously, if, if it's an identification band that's causing the issue, you're probably going to want to hold the ID somewhere so it doesn't get lost. Skeletal edema tells you it's usually post-operative, but it can be caused by disease or drug treatments. And like anything you've seen, it's the usual. Higher pressure, pulsation, manipulation, or massage. Nothing new here. Sectional isn't necessary. Inflammation, same type, same type of treatment. Have you noticed a trend? Realistically, if it's an extravascular reason, raise the pressure, try pulsation, then maybe not rate of flow. That's on and off as necessary. And then it's sectional embalming and then central treatments like hypodermic or um, um, uh, surface compresses. Consider all factors. Constantly perform your embalming analysis. What do I see? Is something working? How do I fix what's going on or should I just leave it? Let me do that. Then repeat. Doing it right always wins out on doing it quick. And I know there's a lot of pressure in the work environment to get it done quick. Getting it done quick can lead to lawsuits. Getting it done right usually does not lead to lawsuits. Resistance, as much as we've sat here and kind of like, you know, given it a bad, bad, bad rap, is not necessarily bad for you. Some resistance is good. Injection pressure is always greater, remember, on the arterial side. That is where we're pushing it in via the machine. Once it gets through the venule, it's pretty much going to be that half pound and it's done. Resistance on the other side, the venule side, forces it to flow in other places. It slows it down, forces diffusion. Without resistance, it's just going to slide right through and exit via drainage. Nothing more would fill up. We create resistance by using alternate or intermittent drainage, and that helps us improve distribution and thusly diffusion. 
when vascular, when vascular resistances are present, the arterial solution will, will generally distribute where little to no resistance exists. All that is saying is the general law of fluids. Fluids flow the path of least resistance. Done. We can analyze the situation. Where is it going? What areas are not getting it? What areas that have gotten it are showing sufficient distribution and diffusion? So three indicators. Number one, is it going in? So you have mixed your punch. You're looking at the body. Nothing's happening. Well, a couple things you probably need to check first. One, what type of fluids you're using? If you're not using fluids with dyes in it, or at least a lot of active dye, it might just be because of the fact that the dyes aren't being apparent and you're freaking out. If you look at the tank, which is easy to do on like a Duotronic, it's easy to do on a, um, on a Portaboy because it's a glass tank and you're staring at the punch, kind of more difficult than some of the Dodge machines because they have the little you know, tank meter, the water level meter. But for the most part, you're going to see it's going down. And after five minute, minutes, it ain't going down, probably it's not injecting. Look down, make sure that the quick releases are plugged in right. Make sure that the hose is plugged in right. Make sure if you have a stopcock, it's on flow. Those sort of silly things. And then check your arterial tube. Do you have the hemostat clamped over the arterial tube holes? If you clamp over the hole, chances are it's not spraying. Is it pushed up and into something when you rammed the arterial tube in? Did you rip open the intima, which then clogged in front of it? That also will prevent flow. You're all going to see those sort of things because the tank isn't going down. Drop of pressure when turning on rate of flow. We talked in embalming one, one of the earlier chapters, about potential differential and actual. Well, when you turn the machine on pump, you should see a little bit of a dip. As the body fills, pressure may start going back up. You may need to adjust pressure to reestablish what you were doing. It makes sense. When you first started shooting in, it's going to fill an empty hose tube probably. And once it hits the blood, it might run into a wall and just do nothing from that point. There should be drainage if the solution is entering the body and making proper circuit through the arteries, capillaries, and veins. If you're doing your job, you should be some type of drainage. Um, not a lot, maybe not any we've seen in some cases, but you should get something. So signs of distribution and diffusion, and these are important. Signs are generally visual and only tell you that the surface is being embalmed. The way I kind of look at this is these are generally signs of distribution. Is the fluid getting all over the body? Not is it preserving, but is it actually traveling? Penetrating agents and arterial solution, massage and restricted drainage will assist you in deep tissue preservation. Use of restricted draining is one of the best techniques to reduce short circuiting. So basically, instead of just putting in those angular drainage forceps or leaving the drain tube open, close it off. Or don't even use angular forceps, use the drain tube. I know, I know. I'm one of those guys that loves using angular forceps. How do you stop the drainage? You put your finger in the hole. It's not that hard. There is no one positive test for determining if a body has sufficient arterial fluid. When in doubt, sectionally embalm hypo and or surface pack, supplemental treatments. Injection pressure and rate of flow. We covered this previously. We'll hit the important topics. Remember, injection pressure is the amount of pressure produced by an injection device to overcome initial resistance with the vascular system. Rate of flow is the amount of embalming solution injected in a given period or at the speed at which embalming solution enters the body, measured in ounces per minute. Ideal rate of flow is whatever rate of flow is necessary to achieve proper preservation of the body. Pressure and flow are related, but not identical, and that's the issue. Do not confuse the two when you're blowing through tests and professional exams, because if you confuse one with the other, the answer is going to be wrong. Of both of those, pressure or rate of flow, rate of flow is of your most concern. So I talked about ideal rate of flow. The solution is evenly distributed when you achieve ideal rate of flow. There's little to no swelling, and... Life is good. Everyone's happy. And today's machines are centrifugal pump machines. Every machine on the market has um, rate of flow. It might not have pressure because we have a lot of machines now that are having automatic sensing. And if you're going to pressure, 
if you are able to set pressure, you need to set pressure rate of flow off. Because as soon as you open rate of flow, it's going to dip. Amount of pressure varies body to body, body area, where you are in the embalming timeline. All those factors of the embalming analysis are going to affect your pressure. And there are schools of thought about pressure. We get on to right before the next um, major topic in this lecture. I'll talk a little bit about an article I read in the Dodge magazine. As embalming proceeds, resistance will increase because we're filling all the empty areas. So when those get full, they're going to start pushing back. The preservative is preserving the arteries and capillaries, making them more rigid, allowing less to pass through. We're filling tissue spaces that might have been dehydrated, and clots are blocking areas for us to flow. So have to adjust things as necessary. Once you've started good distribution, you can kick it up a notch, raise the pressure as long as it maintains a rate of flow slightly greater the amount of drainage. One half total amount injected should be your drainage. So if you're pushing in and it's coming out about the same rate, well, you're probably doing good. Tool schools of thought on the injection rate. Low pressure, rapid rate of flow. And bombing machines are based on the concept. We keep the pressure relatively low and we adjust rate of flow as necessary. And high pressure, highest pressure possible even, and slow rate of flow. Well, this leads me to the article in the Dodge machine, but if we go on to the next slide. I used to embalm under the traditional old school method. All my proctors, Pete Burridge, a um, couple of other guys who I worked under briefly while I was there. Um, and these, these guys are pros. I mean, you know, Pete was a, was a great, great guy. I think he's living up in the mountains right now. He's doing um, doves. He raises doves for services. He was a wonderful guy, one of the best guys I ever worked with. And fact of the matter is, he did the old school method, which set a pressure and then adjust rate of flow as necessary. Hey, that worked. That worked real good for everybody involved. Then one day I was reading the Dodge magazine where some guy said he had one pointed, you know, everybody in his, I forget what it was, 20 or 30 year career. And it's like, uh, okay, genius, whatever. And I said, you know what? I'm going to try it. I'm in a bombing lab. I'm in an institution. I don't have quote unquote paying customers. I can afford to play around with theories and see what happens. So I did exactly what his article said. You turn the pressure up as high as possible that your machine will allow. Basically, you know, inflate a parade float. Then you creak your rate of flow on until you establish the minimum amount. When it bottoms out and there's no more rate of flow, you turn it some more and some more and some more and some more. Every time your rate of flow meter shuts off to zero, turn it again to reestablish a rate of flow. Eventually, the article said, you will maintain a rate of flow. And then, just watch the body embalm itself. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be here for hours. You know, my, my daughter's going to enter college by the time this one body is going to be embalmed. So I walk into my lab, very skeptical. It's a horrible body, um, all sorts of edema and all sorts of garbage. And I do almost a, near, a nearly waterless, ridiculous amount of fluid that you probably never get to do in the professional world, like nine bottles of intrafiant or something like that. It was just a stupid amount of chemical that I used. And did exactly what it said. I did this on a duotronic. And put it all in there. I put the pressure as high as the machine would go. I think it was in like the 100s, the 120s area. And I started cranking that rate of flow. And the little... Um, Little cash I started floating and bubbling and whatnot, and then after about a minute or two, it bottomed back out. No rate of flow. Turned it on again. After about maybe 10 minutes of doing this, watching the little indicator drop back off, it finally just stayed floating at about the 10 mark, about the 5 to 10 mark. And I just let it sit there, 5 to 10 the entire time. And I'm talking with the students, and we're massaging, and we're checking, we're doing whatever. And I one-pointed it. It was a shocker. It actually worked. I, I mean, I was really shocked. I went in with low expectations. I got away with high expectations. And I then started doing that on everybody. And it has worked ever since on everybody I've ever done. I actually had to do one sectional. Um, I had to go and bomb one leg that just wouldn't get anything. And this is like two years after. So I'm telling you, that is a fairly strong one. And how much time did it take, Professor Finn, that your daughter exit college? No, actually, um, here in the labs, from the point that we actually inserted the tube and started injection, it took about 40 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. 
Um, and if we look at the standard rate of injections down the pike and some of the other right, right on the bullet. So if it takes you 30 to 40 minutes to do the entire procedure, we already know that if you are bathing and then terminal bathing within 30 minutes, that's, you probably did not push in enough fluid or whatever. The job was not done right. But an hour and 15 minutes, 40 of that was embalming. Hey, that sounds pretty good. And here's that rule of thumb we just talked about. One gallon per 10 to 15 minutes at a pressure of 2 to 10 pounds to achieve it. Look at that. So if you're in the prep room, and when I first started embalming, I mean, I was told by some of the guys who would come in and embalm that if you're there for more than 45 minutes, you have wasted time. You are losing money as an embalmer. Um, if it's a three-gallon tank, I should be in there just for injection for at least 30 to 45 minutes. No questions asked. That doesn't include anything else that I'm doing. So about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes is fair for a thorough job uh, at an easy pace. Whenever you see swelling, stop and reassess what's going on. When you have sufficient pressure, adequate rate of flow, and restricted drainage, you should have everything right that is going on. If you accomplish it, having that right solution should get that body preserved sufficiently without swelling. We're not going to beat up the center of arterial distribution during the lecture because we covered it before. Um, obviously, if a valve fails, the first valve leading from the arch of the aorta into the heart is going to flow into the heart. If it goes to the next valve, life is, you know, not bad. It still has another valve to kind of stop. If both valves fail and it flows through the heart into the lungs, it's going to come right out as drainage. It's done. So the big thing is do not shoot the pressure with a high rate of flow, like you're going to hit it with a garden hose. You have to creep the stuff in there. Fluid dye is the most reliable sign of distribution. Dyes tell you if it's getting somewhere. That's all it tells you. It's a surface embalming. Also helps prevent formaldehyde gray because you've now counterstained the tissue. And many dye, uh, fluids already contain dyes. That's important. Um, I have played with a couple of uh, straight fluids from both Dodge and Pierce Chemical Companies. Uh, and some people have told me, oh, you need to watch out for this one. You know, Manhattan doesn't have a lot of dye, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and yet when I have used Manhattan or something by itself, I achieve very nice dye. Um, coloration, or if I use just straight um, Regal, I get some really nice color from the Dodge Chemical Company. Don't immediately start reaching for dyes until you've played with some of these fluids so that you understand what they do with bodies. If you see some distension of superficial blood vessels, uh, if someone that has very thin skin, a very elderly person, you might see the arteries and veins in the hand kind of distend, the veins or arteries in the forehead distend. That is an indicator it's flowing. Uh, ensure that it is fluid that's doing it and not gas. Okay, gas or uh, edematous fluid or something else. Drainage only indicates solutions getting somewhere. It does not account for short circuiting. Path of least resistance pushed right back out. And you can get great preservation with little to no drainage. If you see intravascular blood discoloration, liver mortis, for instance, if that starts clearing up, you're doing your job. Uh, but make sure that you have identified that with your embalming analysis prior to ingest. You don't have to be looking for it to clear. Uh, use of massage will definitely help you. Um, this is really good uh, to check for preservation in ears, in cyanotic fingertips that are blue. You can sit there and kind of push those out and watch the fluid kind of fill that in and change its color. Dye in tissues, same as in the other category. Firming of tissues, bam, diffusion. Okay? So dyeing the tissues for diffusion is kind of like, okay, it's only telling me that the fluid is getting there, not if it's preserved. However, firming is a different story. If you see firming going on, you sit there and you pinch it and it's losing skin elasticity, for instance, you know diffusion is happening because that is the formaldehyde reacting with the protein centers. Got to be careful, though. Rigor, frozen tissues can mistakenly show the same type of firming. Uh, my personal favorite, loss of skin elasticity. If you pinch it gently, it should slowly return to normal. Uh, that is one of the most common ones we use for diffusion. Drying is not a good indicator. Just because it's starting to look more dry is not a really safe indicator to say that diffusion has occurred. So be careful with that. Rounding of fin fingertips, lips, and toes. Again, unreliable. Uh, it could be just a fashion fluid in there. You know, it could be um, a fluid that was in the chest that you're now pushing through because you're injecting. 
Strength of solution and method of drainage may have the opposite effect. If you're pushing too strong of a solution, it might pull water out and dehydrate the fingertips. And obviously, if you have an edematous hand and that's what you're looking for, you are trying to see that the swelling is going down. Bleaching, modeling of tissues, not reliable. Not reliable. Dyes can mask it. Uh, fluorescent dye viewed under a black light. I, I'll tell you what. When I went to mortuary school at St. Pete College, um, I got to embalm with Kevin Davis and Gary Brown. I had some good times with them. And they actually had a box of this stuff lying in their uh, chemical storage. And they uh, decided to you know, jack it in the body one day during the lab. And we're using this fluorescent dye under black light. Kevin actually had to raid, I think, his, um, uh, I think it's stepdaughter's bedroom to grab a black light because they didn't have one. And we turned the lights off and we, you know, Randall basically wand over the body. And it was so cool to see that fluorescent dye showing up on the surface of the skin. I mean, it was really, really cool. Uh, but most chemical manufacturers these days do not produce a chemical that does that. Um, and you can do the same exact thing with using our regular dye, which we already know is going to have a much better effect uh, because it's going to counter stain tissues, prevent formaldehyde, grain, a lot of other things. Several signs is the best when looking at the fusion. Check for firmness, check for loss of skin elasticity, and check for the color. If you've done your job right, prepared your solution appropriately, and it has dyes in it, the first clue is you're going to see the color. Once you see the color, start looking for that loss of elasticity and firming, and you should be in good shape. So your observations, again, these are all the things we've been talking about. And to improve things, well, massage is usually pretty good. Dropping the hands over the side of the um, table is another good way to establish uh, the upper extremities with distribution first. Watch out with your rate of flow, but you can increase it as necessary, increasing pressure. And I almost exclusively these days use nothing but pulsation. Uh, it's very, very rare that I use direct, which is a change for me because when I first started embalming under um, Pete and uh, another gentleman I embalmed a couple times, Mike Hook, um, use nothing but direct. Use nothing but direct injection. So I actually modified my, uh, my technique over time. Restrict drainage, massage body, everything we've been talking about. So let's talk about some of the terms. Some of the terms and the actual processes of diffusion. This is important stuff. This is science stuff here. Diffusion is the movement of a solution from inside the capillaries to out. We've talked about that, from inside the capillaries to the tissue spaces. And is the movement of a solvent or a liquid only. The capillaries themselves are the smallest blood vessels we get. When you go up one higher, you get the arterial and venule, um, and then arteries and veins, etc. Walls are composed of endothelium. Endothelium is basically just squamous cells. Blood never has contact with body cells. We have said that earlier in this lecture. I'm saying it again now, so you should know that this is important. Active transport only occurs in living cells. requires energy from the body or energy from a living cell. If you are dead, you are obviously the opposite of a living body, living cell. Um, passive or physical transports, energy originates from a non-living mechanism. It doesn't require cellular energy to do it. Moves from capillaries to interstitial spaces. And the major passive transports that are involved in embalming are pressure filtration, osmosis, and dialysis. Pressure filtration is caused by intravascular pressure. It's one of the most important physical transport systems. Both solute and solvent, liquid and solids, pass into the interstitial spaces. Penetrating agents reduce surface tension. They make things wetter. They reduce the size of things. They reduce the droplet size so they can pass through the pores and the capillaries. IVP places enough pressure on wall to force liquid through the pores similar to that of a lawn soaker hose. That which remains in the vasculature exits as drainage. So if you, I saw a redneck video one time on uh, YouTube. Guy wanted to make a lawn soaker. So he took out his, you know, green hose, loaded up his shotgun with some buckshot, and just basically blew the bejesus out of the full thing, turned it on, and got himself a lawn soaker hose for like, you know, three ninety eight over at Harbor Freight or something. It was ridiculous. Well, by pushing the pressure all the way up, he is shooting, obviously, the water through the holes he made with the shotgun pellets. But some was still coming out the end of the hose. And that's exactly what's happening here. By pushing the pressure, it's forcing itself quicker through the pores of the capillaries, the shotgun pellet holes, 
but it's still going to flow through and come out the veins. In the agonal period, as you are dying, capillary walls expand, pores get bigger in an attempt to get more oxygen and remain that way, so that allows for easier pressure filtration later. If the capillaries decompose or rupture, the fluid goes right into the tissue spaces, causing swelling, distension, little bit of drainage. Um, basically, it's almost like a bruise at this point. You know, we call it a blowout. So it's going to start to swell. The same can happen when you're trying to release rigor. You get in there and you're doing some deep Swedish tissue massage on an arm. Next thing you know, it starts just swelling out and turning bright pink. Um, if, that, if you think that's going to happen, use stronger solutions to keep swelling to a minimum. The more concentrated it is when it gets there, the more it's going to do the work of many. So a little bit goes a long way. Osmosis, okay? Osmosis only involves liquids. It only involves solvents. It's the movement of a solute, movement of a liquid through a semi-permeable membrane from an area of lower concentration, a diluted con concentration, to a higher concentration. Okay? Embalming solutions are more dilute. They're less dense than the interstitial fluids. The embalming solution should be hypotonic. Okay, hypotonic. Osmosis happens from the capillaries to the interstitial spaces and from the interstitial spaces into the cells. It happens both ways. It's a two-way street. If a solution is too dilute, the solution will pass rapidly into the tissues and cells cause swelling, waterlogging, and inadequate preservation. This will speed up the decomp because we're adding more water. The reverse happens if the solution is too concentrated. It's hypertonic. We're running the solution through, and water is going to rush out of the tissue spaces to try to dilute what's going on inside of the arterial system. Review terms, primary and secondary dilution, so that you are aware of what these things are. And lastly, dialysis, diffusion of solids within a solution through a semi-permeable membrane. Dissolved in cytoplasm and in the interstitial fluid are crystalloids and colloids. Crystalloids are very small solutes. Colloids are large solutes. Most crystalloids can pass through both the capillaries and the cell walls. They're small enough to get through both holes. Colloids can pass through the capillary pores but cannot get into the cell walls. There are three definitions in your book for dialysis. Diffusion of a dissolved crystalloid solution of a solution, or dissolved, diffusion of dissolved crystalloids through a solution, or in a solution through a semi-permeable membrane. So I done screwed that one up, sorry. Diffusion of crystalloids across a semi-permeable membrane that is impermeable to colloids. Process of separating crystalloids or smaller particles from colloids, larger particles, by the difference in their rates of diffusion through a semi-permeable membrane. Professor Finn, which one are we responsible for? All of them. So it gives you a little graph. It gives you a little graph of what we've been talking about. Concentrated embalming elements are spread through the tissue fluid by passive transport systems. Passive embalming solution in the cells is by adsorption, osmosis, and dialysis. We've already beaten diffusion to death, okay? Now, adsorption. Adsorption is important. Cytoplasm is composed of cytosol with all organelles suspended in it. This is called a colloid dispersion. The large molecules, because of their large surface area, adsorb molecules. Adsorbing means they stick to the larger molecule and become part of the molecule. It's surface-only process. Absorb on the other hand, means that the larger molecule consumes the smaller and enters the molecule and dissolves. When we talk about colloids and humectant chemicals, here is my cell. And we're going to talk about adsorbing. So here's my capillary. All my stuff's coming out. And all of a sudden, all my colloid particles get stuck on the outside of my cell, thus preventing water from getting in and water from getting out. Moisture retainer. That is adsorption. Now, absorption. My stuff comes out, and the larger molecule, the larger cell, is taking in what I have, in this case, preserved crystalloid items, 
into the cell, which then reacts with the protein centers, and I get a preserved cell. So do not confuse the adsorption and the absorption. That's important. Gravity filtration, no-brainer. Extravascular settling by gravitational force into a dependent area of the body. Translated, gravity pulls it down. Boom. This is specifically referring to fluid that has exited the capillaries and is present in the interstitial fluid and then settles. So it flows into the interstitial space. Gravity takes over and pulls it down, and it does its thing. Folks, thanks for paying attention. We'll see you in the next lecture.